You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-98 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-98, the most popular Japanese PC series of the early 1990s. Last time on PC-98 Paradise, we looked at the first Farland Story game, and I had so much fun playing that one that after finishing it, I immediately took out the next game. If I remember correctly, unlike the first one, I only played partway through this one back in the 2000s on my first PC-98, and never finished it. Though I did play all the way through the remake of the first two games on the PCFX even earlier than that. Playing all the way through the second game on the PC-98 should still be a fun new experience for me. From what I've seen, the series seems to just keep getting better and better, so stick around and see why. I received a lot of comments on the first video asking which of the games have English patches, so let's clear that up now. Of the seven games for PC-98, all but the last one were translated back in 2003. There were also a large number of Farland games for Windows, and of those, as far as I know, only the final game, Farland Symphony, has an English patch. As mentioned in the first video, there's also a partial English patch for the PCFX game, but those are all the English patches for the series that exist right now, as far as I know. Apparently, the translator of the PC-98 games felt that the games were way too easy, an understandable opinion, to be sure, and he decided to alter the difficulty. He only started doing that from the third game on, though. But anyway, today let's look at the second Farland Story game titled Farland Story Denki, Ako no Ensei, which means Farland Story Legend, The Journey of King Ark. Oh yeah, and a couple people asked in the comments in the first video. No, these games aren't related in any way to the Ark the Lad games. The protagonist just happens to have the same name. The character designs in the first two games were done by someone named Kazuhiro Matsuzaka, with help from Kyoto Animation for the character concepts and package design. Anyway, let's see what's inside. Again, there's a small fold-out poster with the same illustration as the cover. Here's the manual, which unlike the first is in full color and has some illustrations of the characters. And ooh, this one comes with a music CD. Tiwatarai Drive Mix, Farland Story Denki, dedicated to all drivers. This is a soundtrack CD arranged by the composer of the game. The mixes here are mostly 90s electronic dance music with lots of weird voice samples mixed in. There's also a vocal version of the ending theme. Back to the packaging. The game itself is contained on four floppy disks again, and as you can see, I have the 3.5 inch version of this one. The hard drive installer is located on disk A. I'll select the source floppy drive, which is drive C, and the destination hard drive, drive A. This time, to keep my hard drive a little better organized, I'll install the game to a folder named TGL, which I created earlier. The installer will have me insert each floppy disk in order. Once installation is complete, we can start the game by running fsl.bat in the root directory of the hard drive. I assume the L stands for legend, but who knows. The hard drive installation is a lot better here than in the first game. There's no meaningless message asking you to make a user disk even while running from a hard drive, and the quit game option actually allows you to exit back to DOS. Nice. To watch the opening, however, you still have to run a separate application named fslop.bat. The opening here is quite nice like in the first game, with some fluid animations. It shows the battle between Ark and D.Va that took place prior to the first game. We then see Ark inserting the sacred sword into the seal thingy, and finally we see Ark with some of his friends he met in his first adventure. The BGM includes a refrain of the title screen melody from the first game. The opening is about the same length as that of the first game, and all in all it's quite nice. At the end, it sends you back to DOS, whereas the first game just repeated the opening endlessly until you reset. Back in the main application, starting a new game will give you a screen asking you which letter you see displayed. I ate pee pee. <laughs> you little trick guy! This is in order to fix the graphical bug I mentioned in the first video. There are two graphical modes in order to ensure the game displays correctly on different PC-98 models, which this game separates into machine types A and B. 
Next, we're asked if we want to begin by playing through three side stories, or skip straight to the main game. The side stories are quite interesting and definitely worth playing through, but they're a bit difficult compared to the earlier stages of the main game, which is why you have the option to skip them. I'll choose to play the side stories, and we're taken to Ark, Ferio, and Dokati sitting around the castle telling stories. In this game, you can see there are a lot of new character portraits showing different emotions, making them much more expressive compared to the first game. The dialogue parts are all set against a black background in this one, and this seems to be the only game in the series that does this. For the first story, Ark and Dokati tell Ferio about the time they were looking for the sacred sword in the first game, but got lost along the way. Okay, I promise the other two side stories are more interesting. Tell how Luigi find Yoshi and Yoshi rescue princess! For the next one, Dokati tells the story of how he took Ark away from the castle and the evil queen when he was a child. Oh, by the way, it's going to be pretty hard to avoid spoilers for the first game in this video, so, uh, sorry. This one is pretty cool since the leader is Dokati instead of Ark, and the game will end if he dies. Your characters are also a bunch of random wizards, knights, and priests, rather than actual characters. By the way, you don't get to keep any of your experience or equipment from the side stories in the main game, so don't bother making your characters any better than they need to be to get through the stages. The battle against the evil queen is one of the hardest sections in the entire game in my opinion. The queen keeps warping your characters to different parts of the stage, so you have to spend several turns moving them back toward her as she quickly recovers her HP. You basically have to get several strong hits all in one turn before she warps everyone away. Luckily, you only need to drain a certain amount of her HP before she lets you go. For the final side story, Ark goes to check on Eleanor, who has been staying at the castle recovering from her injuries from the first game. She tells the story of when she and D.Va traveled to the demon world in order for D.Va to become the Black Knight. Hmm, I always just assumed he was called the Black Knight in the first game since he wore black armor and a helmet to hide his face. I'm not sure why being the Black Knight needs to be some sort of supernatural thing that gives him evil superpowers or whatever. It seems like this might be a minor retcon of the first game, but who knows. In this scenario, D.Va is the party leader, with a bunch of wizards and ninjas at his command. The ninjas are an enemy character from the first game. It's also kind of cheap and funny that D.Va is practically just Ark with a darker color palette. I guess he's literally just Ark's dark rival. After the third side story, Ark and Eleanor are interrupted by the plot of the main game. The sacred sword that Ark used to slay the Dark Lord has been stolen and they have to get it back. So we're taken now to stage 4, the first stage of the main game. You may have noticed by now that quite a bit of the character animation is directly recycled from the first game though there are a handful of all new enemies and playable characters as well, including Eleanor here. It may look very similar to the first, but there are actually quite a large number of system changes here. In fact, most of the major changes that were made throughout the PC-98 sequels happened right here in the second game. For instance, instead of the weird question mark that would come up in the first game in order to confirm a character move, from the second game on, you get a menu asking if you want to have the character attack or heal after moving, or just do nothing. It's a subtle difference, but you'll definitely notice it when coming straight from the first one. Here's a bigger change. You can now move your characters through their allies. In the first game, the characters would often create traffic jams when trying to cross a bridge or pass through any sort of bottleneck in the terrain. The order to gather the characters around Ark can now be executed instantly at any time, rather than occurring at the end of the turns. In practice, it doesn't really make a huge difference, but overall, I prefer it this way. It feels more intentional when you execute it. Each character now has their own weapons inventory, whereas weapons were shared in the items inventory in the first game. In practice, this means that if a character picks up or buys a new weapon for a different character, you won't be able to equip it until it gets physically passed to the proper owner. You first need to place the two characters nearby one another so you can use the new exchange menu. Usually it's easiest to do this at the beginning of each stage when the characters are all grouped together. So when a character picks up a new weapon, you can either move them toward the weapon's proper owner before the end of the stage, or remember that you picked it up so that you can give it to them at the beginning of the next stage. You can even use the exchange menu to gradually pass weapons down the line from one character to another. This whole thing is certainly a lot more tedious than the way it was done in the first game, but at least it does make more sense. The class changes have been removed completely in this one, and the leveling system has been improved quite a bit. 
There are no longer level caps at 20, so it's easier than ever to make a few of your characters into superhuman tanks by the end of the game. The characters also don't get leveled down when they're killed, which makes things a lot easier, but also really lowers the stakes in my opinion. In the first game, I tried my best not to let the characters die, but here I don't really care as long as Ark doesn't die. The healers also do obtain experience from healing in this one, and the process for reviving a dead character is also a bit different. After you revive a character, you have to wait two turns before they become usable again. Or you can use two healers to heal the character twice, and then the character will become usable again right away in the next turn. Of course you can skip all of this by instead offering the dead character a refreshing whiskey. So let's get back to the story. Throughout the second game, Ark gradually meets up with most of the characters from the first one, as well as some brand new characters as well. There's a mage named Raya who is looking for her fiancé. The stage where we meet her is full of deserted villages and ghosts to fight. In a dark twist of fate, the boss of this stage is the possessed spirit of her dead fiancé. After the party puts his soul to rest, Raya joins the party permanently. Most of this game takes place in the northern part of the kingdom, and many of the stages are winter themed. In one of them you find a snow woman, or Yuki Onna, a character archetype originating from Japanese legend that you'll sometimes see recurring in present day Japanese fiction. She joins the party after being defeated, but unfortunately she leaves after just one stage, since she can't leave her home in the snowy mountains. I won't last long up above. Eventually Ark and company find the fiend who has the sacred sword, but he needs someone from the royal bloodline who can wield it, so he kidnaps Eleanor. Ha! Got you at last! The boss of the following stage is a brainwashed Eleanor wielding the sacred sword. But by this time, I had Ark and Dokati leveled up so high she was no match for them. She comes back to her senses and returns the Sacred Sword to Ark. With the sword equipped, Ark has an extra powerful attack which can be executed by charging for one turn. Some of the other characters also have charge attacks after obtaining their best weapon. The rest of the game then has the party fighting the same hollow black knight that D.Va fought in the side story earlier, and then traveling to the demon world where they fight the end boss, Zavel, the right hand man of the Dark Lord who was defeated in the first game. Eleanor thought he had been destroyed along with his master, but apparently not. I had no problem taking him down with Ark's charge attack and my unstoppable Dokati. But if you want a second opinion, the author of the translation patch says the end boss is by far the hardest part of the game though he says the game as a whole is otherwise extremely easy. The ending doesn't have many surprises, but the party is shocked when Dokati casually mentions he has a wife. I guess they assumed since he's a big ugly dwarf, he's a bachelor for life. Speaking of marriage, the final screen of the game is Ark and Ferio's wedding photo. Not exactly a shocking conclusion, but it'll do. A sorely missing feature in the first game was a sound test, and the second one remedies that with a music mode that not only includes all the second game's tunes, but those of the first game as well. When you select one of these tracks, it will ask you to insert disc D of the first game. To make things more convenient, instead you can copy all the sound files from the first game into the directory of the second game in order to play them without any disc switching. One thing you'll notice though is that the first game has 18 tracks, while the second has only 14. Still, I personally feel that the music that is here in the second game is quite a bit better than that of the first. That game had three composers, and only one of these three returns to compose the music for the second game, Tatsuya Watarai, while another of them, Takahiro Yonemura, did the FM conversions. The first game had more of a generic RPG sound to it, which some may prefer, but I found the compositions more interesting in the second game. They're more complex and sound like they could probably fit with a space shooter or pretty much any game genre. The FM sounds are cleaner and create more of a complex tapestry of sound. In a game that looks so much like its predecessor with reused animation, etc., it really helps that there's a soundtrack here that feels new and fresh so that you know you're playing a new game. I also love that the music doesn't change during the enemy turns. This allows the same music to just keep playing throughout the stage without interruptions. The first game had an annoying tune that was repeated for every enemy turn throughout the entire game. And while we're talking about sound, it's also very cool that they added some PCM voices for when a few of the spells and attacks are executed. 
up to now in this video, I've been referring to only the Stereo FM Soundboard 86 music, as if it's the only option available. But just as in the first game, you actually have four different types of sound hardware to choose from. This last option is sound off, so you can just ignore that one. The MT32 MIDI option that was in the first game has been removed, and now DS is the only MIDI type supported. You probably also noticed one new option that wasn't in the first game. This one is pretty self-explanatory, but remember that music CD that came with the game? Well, that's going in here. Let's compare all four sound options in order now. There were even a couple of secret codes added in the second game. While the TTL logo is displayed when first booting up, hold the graph key and press right click. This activates a sort of debug mode. Now when you click on any character, you can select warp and immediately move them to any spot on the map. Now with this enabled, there's one additional trick you can also do. Anytime during the game, hold the control, shift and graph keys and the right click button all at once. This will make the menu rapidly toggle on and off, but while still holding all of these, left click on any character and their status will be maxed out at level 99. As for ports of the game, once again there was an MS-DOS version, released in some parts of Asia, including Korea and Taiwan. And, as mentioned in the first video, there are remakes which combine both the first and second game into one on the Super Famicom, PCFX, PlayStation 1, and Windows. I also feel it's important to mention that there is a game called Farland Story 2 on the Super Famicom, but this is a completely original game, different from any of the PC-98 titles. And if things weren't already confusing enough, that Super Famicom game was also ported to the Sega Saturn, where it was called Farland Story Habo no Mai. But again, neither of these games are ports of the second Farland Story game, so they don't belong in this video. Let's get back to the subject at hand and wrap things up. The second Farland Story game on PC-98 has only 14 stages, which is the same number as the first one. I like that the stages in the second game tend to be smaller and simpler. This makes navigating them far less tedious, but it also makes the game very short as well. It's really no wonder that the first two games were combined into one for all the remakes. The second is definitely a short, yet sweet game in my opinion. I like all the improvements they made and thoroughly enjoyed the whole thing. In fact, I think I may be kind of addicted to the series now, and have already played through much of the third game at the time of making this video. The series is going to get even better hereafter, with longer games and much more original stories and more interesting characters, so stick around as we explore more of these games together in the future. Thanks for watching this episode of PC98 Paradise, and as always, I want to give a special thanks to all my patrons on Patreon, as well as thanks to everyone for watching, liking, and subscribing. I'll see you all back here again for the next video.